So just let me introduce myself first. My name is Bernardo Magnini uh, from uh, FBK, Fondazione Bruno Kessler in Trento. And we, wa we are one of the uh, four academic partners in the excitement project uh, mentioned by, by Ido this morning. So this is the second session of, uh, uh, of the day. And uh, we have uh, five uh, presentations. Uh, the first one uh, will be given by uh, Ron Beckerman uh, as uh, um, an overview talk. So Ron uh, is a senior lecturer at the Faculty of Management at the University of Haifa. Uh, he got uh, his PhD in computer science uh, from the University of uh, Massachusetts. He, uh, he also has a, a relevant experience in the industries, both industries and academia. Uh, as for industry, I, I would like to mention uh, experience uh, as a senior researcher at uh, LinkedIn. And uh, uh, he also served uh, as chief data officer at uh, Carmel Ventures. So in addition to this industrial experience, uh, he also has a quite uh, a long record of publications uh, in, uh, in uh, conferences and, and journals. Uh, his talk uh, is about uh, 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 about the, a lot of data, let's say. <laughs> so thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much for such a kind introduction. So uh, you might have seen uh, the flyers here with, with the names of the talks, and my, my talk has a different name. I was like, why don't I do it like uh, less formal? And uh, this is the problem that I guess you have seen in your life, right? You have the data. What are you doing now? So this is the, the, the biggest trouble that uh, many of us have seen, especially given the fact that we have lots of data that is now publicly available. And the biggest question here is that if you have that much data, well, I'm a text mining guy, so I'll be talking about documents, right? You have like millions of documents. And why in the world should you ask the question what you are doing with those documents? When the data set was small, you should have done something, right? And now when the data is huge, you have a problem. So this is uh, not where you are supposed to be, but we know that we are in a situation like that once in a while. And you know, an obvious answer is like, you know, I just wasn't there when the data was small. Uh, I'll give you an example. So uh, probably you heard about this uh, Enron email data set um, that got publicly available through this uh, enormous courtroom saga of uh, Enron about like 12 years ago, something like that. So I, by, by that time, I was working with uh, Andrew McCallum at the University of Massachusetts, and I think I was the first data scientist to put my hands on this data. I was so excited. So I obviously ran some tests with that data. And it turned out that 40% of the data was duplicates. When I re-ran all my tests after removing the du duplicates, you know what? It was just a completely different data set. So before you go to any task, you need to figure out what you have on your data. Um, when can it happen that uh, you have this data and you actually don't know what, what, what's going on? There is another problem here. It is, you have the data, you know that it's big, but you might want to ask the user to like label this data when it's building up, but you know what, it might not make that much sense after all. And here's an example. I was working for LinkedIn, and one of my tasks was to uh, categorize the user profiles by the level of seniority. And you know what? You just don't want to ask the user what your level of seniority is, because everyone is senior. <laughs> so uh, when you have uh, problems like that, you, you probably have to, to, to start from scratch. No, no way you can do anything better than that. And another problem that you might have is that you do have the data. 
you do have a lot of metadata about it. And you know what? You don't really trust this metadata. Here's an example. Um, Uh, I'm, I'm working with patterns, so this is my data. Look at that, lots of stuff, right? And this is the metadata. Lots of stuff. And people are manually classifying patterns into a huge uh, taxonomy of categories, and each category here has lots of subcategories, so you know what? I am looking at the data, I'm like, no way a human can do it really well. So obviously many mistakes are in that particular data. Let me go back to the presentation. Yeah. The data just doesn't fit the screen. So we are back to the same problem we started with. We have lots of data, now what? We need to figure out what we have in this data, and obviously one of the solutions, you, I'm not saying anything totally new here, is cluster analysis. So you take the data, you cluster it, you look at the centroids, and by the centroids you kind of decide what you have in your data. <coughs> so one first trouble is that if you have like, you know, hundreds of instances, it's not a problem, right? You know what you have. If you have millions, clustering is just too heavy. So basically, there are so many clustering algorithms, they don't run that well computationally on, uh, on uh, big data sets. And the solution is parallelization. Uh, I happen to work in this field for quite a while. I'll just, you know, f since it's an overview talk, I'll, I'll show you some uh, uh, quick example how to parallelize k-means, for example. So you have the data. Even visually, you kind of think that there are like three clusters here, right? And you need to, to find them. And you start with some type of centroids. You, you, you set them in some way. There are many heuristics how to do that. And then you basically split the data 50-50 between two machines. You can multiply it by you know, the number of machines that you have. Then you run one iteration of k-means locally. You associate data instances to, to centroids. Those are the same centroids over all the machines. And then you recompute the centroids locally. Now they are different. Now you're bringing them back to the same master node or whatever, and you combine them together. And this is the way how you actually can parallelize scan means, and it runs fairly well, fairly fast. What is the problem? The problem is that, first of all, you can't figure out what your magic number k is in k means, right? You just don't know how many clusters you should have. And the second, you know what? Clustering is just fundamentally inaccurate. So you cluster a data, you're getting something. You look at this something, you're like, huh? It kind of makes sense, but no more than that. So uh, uh, why I'm so confident about that, I kind of spent, wanted to say wasted, 10 years of my life working on clustering. And there are clustering algorithms that are good, actually. And there are some that are even parallel. And there are some that are even uh, much better than that. So clustering, good clustering algorithms exist. They, they, they are fast. But uh, you still have this limitation of, like, you know, it is unsupervised. So if you want something that is more, you know, you can trust, you would probably go to supervised learning and you'd do some type of uh, classification of your data. Now, you have a huge data set and you want to do some classification on this data, right? So figure out which data points belong to which uh, classes. So what do you do? First, you need to label the data. And once you have labeled data, then you can learn a model, you know how it works. And then once you have the model, you can apply it to the entire data set and say, finally, what in the world do I have in the data? The problem is, who is going to label the data for you? Who is going to do that? How much data should you label? What is the data that you need to choose to label? All those are big troubles, right? You don't take enough data. You, 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 you build a model on a, some, a very small portion of your data. You end up with an accurate model. So this is the problem. And we published a paper about that uh, three years ago. 
the paper was that, you know what, guys, we actually do, uh, can do classification very accurately uh, almost without machine learning, pretty much doing the, 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 the manual job. And uh, we, we, we do use machine learning a little bit. But generally, how do you approach to, uh, this problem? Again, you have a huge data set. You don't know what you have. The first thing, even before you like uh, think about the model, you need to agree on classes. Like, what, what are the classes that you're looking for, right? It's, it's not clear even at that stage, right? You just have raw data. Then once you have the classes, you need to, to come up with some type of a controlled vocabulary that would say which are the words or phrases or whatever you want to look at in order to, to, to go with your classification. Once you have this vocabulary, you can build common phrases in the text. So common phrases, um, we prove in this paper that Whatever you are doing, you won't have too many common phrases. Well, it, it really de de depends on how you define commonality here. But generally, you won't have too many not to be able to, to uh, categorize them manually. So once you have phrases, you actually can categorize them, that, them manually. The, the, well, crowdsourcing, obviously. like not, I'm not going to categorize data all my, by myself. And once you have this categorization, you can check the consistency of this uh, categorization using machine learning. So you're basically doing like 80% of your work manually, and you, you use machine learning to, to, to prove the consistency. And once you have that, you actually can categorize documents by looking for those phrases. They're in or they're out. It doesn't work with long documents. It won't work with patents, for example. But it does work with small, short documents, for example, like uh, you know people's uh, job titles and descriptions on LinkedIn. So it works actually fairly well. Classification is also not perfect for the problem of figuring out what you have on your data. First of all, it's kind of heavy, right? Second, even whatever I have just talked about, you can't have too many categories out there. It's going to be very coarse grained. So you have a data set that's millions of documents. You would say, yeah, there are some documents about sports and some documents about politics. But you won't, would never go deeper into that because it's very hard to do. And if you do want to go deeper into that, into fine coarse uh, classification, you know what? Fine grain classification is fundamentally inaccurate. So you, uh, you, you go to the level when you have only a few instances per class, and just you know you, you will have many mistakes. The data is just too sparse. So it is a solution, probably not perfect. Let's move to a different solution to the same problem. OK, you have the data. What do you do? And it's a search, some type of search that uh, built on you know like indexing your data and running queries. So the more queries you are running on that data, the more you are supposed to understand what you have, right? Very simple. What's the problem here? The problem is that, yeah, you can run queries. And the queries will return very relevant documents. But will it help you to figure actually out what you have on your data? So like. I claim that not, and here is an example. Like I'm working with patents, right? So it's, it's my domain for today. And here is a, a query, Raider. So Google is saying that it's returning 4 million patents about Raiders, sorted on one dimension from most relevant to least relevant, which kind of doesn't make any sense here, as you can understand, right? So I think that Google is dramatically overestimating the number of patents that have the word trader. I think it's like two order of magnitude less. But even if you are given 40,000 patents sorted sequentially, what can you learn about that? Do you know what's going on in the world of traders in patents? I wouldn't say so. Here's another example, which is a little bit different. Here's the, the query is audit, right? Me, meaning financial auditing, accounting, and stuff like that. There are patents on that, right? The trouble is that the word audit is ambiguous. And a person who is working in financial auditing doesn't know that. 
It turns out that in patents, the word audit means anything but financial auditing. So it's basically anything that has something to do with like, you know, like quality assurance or something like that has the word audit. So we need to figure out that we actually are talking about financial auditing and not anything else. So search is not ideal here in, in this uh, story, but I would say that at least it's kind of bringing us to, to, to where I want to be, and I do propose some type of a solution for that. It does have something to do with search and, and, and clustering. It is based on visualization because, you know, you want to figure out what you have on your data. You want to look at it, your eyes. It's not cheap, but, you know, you, you can run it uh, offline mostly. And it's not really novel, admittedly, but it has a twist of big data. And it's fundamentally accurate. So it's, uh, you know, like uh, it's kind of hard to prove, but, but anyhow, I'll, I'll just show you what, what I mean, and you'll see that, that it actually can, can produce very good results. So I'm talking about uh, semantic network or um, affinity matrix, whatever you, 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 whatever you call it. So you, build, you have your documents, you build a similarity matrix between documents, yeah, and that, that's what you have, basically. So it, and it, it's a big graph of all documents, and you want to, to uh, use it to figure out what you actually have on your data. What, like, you know, affinity metrics is not really novel, right? But the trick is that by two, three years ago, a matrix of like five million by five million would sound nonsensical. Who can work with data like that? It's 25 trillion comparisons. You know what? We are in the world of big data. 25 trillion? It's doable. It's expensive, but doable. And you know, if you are smart, and you are, you don't have to do 25 trillion comparisons. We are talking about billions. Billions, not trillions. So what, do, so what we have done so far, we took 5 million patents published by USPTO over the last 40 years, and we built a huge semantic map of all patents that were published out there. And this is the, the entity that we're working with. And once you have that, you actually can ask any specific question. You cannot show the entire map visually, but you can drill down to any region and you will know exactly what is going on in that region because that's what you have. So it's basically not what you found, but what you have on this data. Let me show you an example. I talked about that. Yeah, I talked about that too. So, we take uh, an example, and the example is um, eBay. So we have, uh, we took uh, 550 patents of eBay, and out of those 5 million patents, we chose about 250 patents that are not eBay, but very closely related to eBay patents, and you actually can visualize it's about 800 patents. You can visualize this like that, and you end up with one big mess. But Gephi is a good tool, you press the button and the situation is, is going to become much uh, uh, clear here. So each green dot here is an eBay patent. Each red dot is a patent that is not eBay, not, was not, doesn't belong to eBay, but is very closely semantically related to eBay's patents. And uh, even uh, well, and, uh, the, the um, the thickness of the connection is the, the level of, uh, of semantic relationships between those patents. Again, we are talking about semantic relationships. Two patents are close to each other or connected with, 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 the, with an edge if they are talking about similar topics, not that they were issued by the same entity or they have some type of metadata associated with it that is similar. No, they are talking about similar topics. So even from, uh, so it's uh, still stabilizing, but what, what, what you can see from here is that this is the area where it's, uh, uh, it's totally under eBay's control, right? So like there are no red 
guys out here. It's all eBay, so eBay do doesn't have to worry too much. It, it, no one is gonna like, you know, sue them for, for something like that because there's like nothing around, it's only them. Versus when you have situations like that, for example, over here, you see a few green dots surrounded by red dots. I would say I'm not saying that there is like any type of infringement, but I, if I wore eBay, I would have a close look at that just to figure out that everything is kosher. And once you have something like that, look at this. The level of interconnectivity is like really bad here, right? And you have red guys and green guys. This is not uh, an easy case. I call it a war. And it actually, I know, that's, once I built a ma that map, I, the first thing that I wanted took a look was exactly that. And it turns out that there's a Wikipedia page saying that there was a guy named Thomas Woolston who wrote a few patents. It turns out that uh, th these patents were in a big clash with eBay. So he, he sued eBay and, and got $25 million out of it. Guys, I don't understand much in patents. Do you understand much in patents? We don't have to. Look at this picture. You just look at the picture, you can find some type of business on sites just from looking for uh, uh, those pictures. And remember, we, we actually have everything, right? We're just drilling down to different areas. Let me <coughs> go back to my uh, presentation. <laughs> Another example. So you can look into any um, like topic in this. Like you have everything, right? So you come up with a talking a topic. You can look into that. We were talking about financial auditing. Why don't I show you what's going on in financial auditing? First of all. Five minutes, okay, okay. How do you approach a problem like that? So if you, if you just query audit, you end up with huge amount of uh, uh, patents. If you query financial audit, you end up with like five <coughs> patents or something like that. So the approach is you need to build a language model of, of financial mo uh, auditing. And you need to look for those patents that use this language, the language of financial auditing. Once you have it, you actually can visualize, and, and this is a, some type of visualization. What you can do is you can do cluster analysis on that visualization, and it's not very difficult, actually. So we end up here with like uh, 10 uh, major clusters, and from each cluster, you can choose one pattern that is kind of representative to take a look at. Guys, we started with 5 million patterns. We end a topic that is like not clear what, what you're doing with, right? Because it's like ambiguous. We end up, ended up with a picture of, I don't remember how many, but like a couple of hundred probably, patents. And you, even at those couple of hundred, you don't have to look. You, you have 10 patents to look, and once you have looked at them, you know what's going on in this area. And now you obviously can have some more visualizations, like you know how it's distributed over time, what are who are the major players in this area, and stuff like that. Those are obvious things that, but you still have to have, right? And uh, I wanted to show you what whatever other people uh, are doing in this domain as well, like uh, from the visualization point of view. They're like, you know what? Just the plain dots is not good. You can label them for, for, by, for example, the assignee, the company that, that produces these patents. And it, it, it's becoming kind of clearer. What I would say that it's kind of mess. But you know, on the other hand, if you really need to know what's going on in a particular area of patents, that mess is very helpful. Uh, the graph that they're building here is the graph of citations. Which patents cite which patents? I'm saying that citations are fundamentally inaccurate, but it's, it's my personal view. So you can add uh, labels or topics to, to those visualizations. They kind of let you explore. It, it, the, the, the picture is not blind any longer. You can explore what's going on. It's also kind of, it has 
pluses and minuses, obviously. So Inography is a company that is uh, doing it uh, fairly well. And Thomson Reuters is doing it even mu much more beautiful. Look at that. So they are doing patent landscaping using real, like you know, the, the, the visualization of a real map. So here they kind of abstracting out the, the patents themselves. They are just looking into some areas, which I'm not sure whether it's good or bad. That's what they have. But generally, it's, it's an approach to, to visualization. Let me come back to, oh my god, it doesn't look. Uh, it's just too, too, too light here. I, I'm showing you the visualization of Google patents. So I have about 10,000 of them here and about 4,000 of patents that are not Google but very closely related. So what I wanted to say is that you don't have to visualize 200 patents. You can go to, to quite a few thousands. I'm sorry for being like very, um, very light, but. Um, Believe me, you, you can work with a map like that looking in different areas. Um, so we, we are done more or less. We explore different ways to look at your data. I am saying that uh, we have a way. What's the problem with that, uh, what, 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 whatever I propose? You still cannot visualize everything. You cannot say everything that is going on. You can drill down into areas. But on the other hand, if you come up with an idea of topics that cover the entire space, then probably you, 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 uh, you can be good at having like a broad view of everything that you have in a multi-million document collection. So this is the future work. I hope that I'll be working on that. And uh, thank you very much.